Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. So you'll be very, very pleased to know that I'm not just going to list a whole bunch of geeky technology that you should spend money you don't have uh, purchasing. Um, instead, I wanted to look at what's happening in the world. I've mercilessly nicked this slide from someone else, but it's important. So on this side, we have the uh, Homo erectus hand axe versus the mouse. Um, now, the, the, the boring thing here, clearly, is that it, they're both shaped for a hand. What's more interesting is that the hand axe was essentially made by one person. And it is not a joke to say that there's no human being alive on planet Earth today who knows how to make a mouse. And by that, I mean, you would have, to understand how to actually make a mouse, you would need to know how to get oil out of the ground and turn that oil into plastic. You need to know how to get metal out of the ground and to turn those at that into wires and so on. And it's this division of labor which has allowed society to, to, to move forward. Uh, to the extent that whilst this is a million years of no innovation there, I doubt any of you have a mouse that bad uh, back home <laughs> because it's changed so much since this slide was made. Equally, moving forward, when people wander around the, the Sun King, the Palace of Versailles, and you're taking the photos of more gold than you can possibly imagine, and everyone thinks how amazing it was that he had 498 kitchen staff to cook whatever he wanted. But the reality is, with 10 pounds in your pocket right now in Edinburgh, every one of you has more than 498 people waiting to make you amazing food. In fact, each of us has the ability to eat better than he did. But what I want to talk to you today is in terms of what does the internet mean? It's not just great cat videos. <laughs> the fundamental technology is really, it's about lowering transaction costs to do things, you know, and that crosses all elements of society. And these are the things I want to talk about first. Uh, excuse the really bad screen resolution of this, but this graph, this long tail graph, this power law, um, actually explains an awful lot of different things that happen on the internet. So this is the example of Wikipedia. And the bottom line there is that a very small number of people do almost all of the work. And if you and I, we may, we may change one comma, possibly, uh, you know, but it works because of this long tail of participation. The same graph shows the difference between Amazon and something like HMV, where something like HMV could only ever stock the hits. They can only ever stock the things that are going to be hits. So, you know, the Beyonce's latest album, whereas um, Amazon can, can stock the, you know, the Bolivian nose flute uh, album uh, because of this unlimited shelf space. And this is all things, of course, many of you are aware of this. And this idea of the physical space of a museum versus the, the, the wider unlimited shelf space of what, what's possible. But what I want to sell you on today is that software is the core growth of all industries. So in Codebase, I don't care what sector people think they're in, it's the software core, the digital core in the middle of it, which allows us to go from one to a million users without needing to build a factory for 100 million to make widgets half a cent cheaper. And with all of the advances, it's only now, the timing is just now where this stuff is all coming together and, and revolutionizing everything. We used to think that was an awful lot of people on the internet. But this year, we've already, and actually we've superseded this, there are now more than three billion people, and actually just now we're rapidly approaching four billion. Now, four billion people is practically every adult human being alive on planet Earth has access to the internet. Now, admittedly, there's a bunch of those that are on, in the third world, in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, are on feature phones. It's your old Nokia, so it's text-based. But with the ever-decreasing price of these cheap Android smartphones, this is changing. And when we say everyone, you know, we really do mean it. Um, it's everyone on planet Earth. So here's sub-Saharan African population coverage. You know, um, there are more people with mobile phones than electricity. Today, there are now more people with mobile phones than have a street address. So when we're so often thinking about technologies being something which was sold to, to rich people, 
Now that's changed completely. And what would a, a, would a bank ever historically imagine uh, setting up bank accounts for people who earn less than $1 a day? Of course not. But now, there's an awful lot of us. And it means that mobile is so different. This laptop that I'm speaking of, of this may as well be the old mainframe because mobile is, is everything, and it is fundamentally different. There's only 1.6 billion PCs ever sold. The, the amount of mobile d utterly, utterly dwarfs uh, any kind of PC uh, market space. But it's your phone, and it knows where you are. So what does it mean? This multiplier effect for society across, across every sector, when you get two to three times more smartphones and PCs, the opportunity is just so large because it's personal. It's your phone. Remember, you used to phone a house. You were phoning a physical location. Now, you're not phoning a physical location. You're phoning a person. You don't know if that person's in Spain or Russia. You're phoning the person. It's taken everywhere. You have frictionless access. It has sensors on it. It has cameras. It has location, payment systems. It's a social platform, and it's easier to use. This is a really frightening picture. This is the picture of you know, more than half of our time awake is spent on some form of media and communication. Um, and people think that's a bad thing, and then you realize that in your pocket you have access to your personal bodily library. You've got access to the, the well, wealth of human knowledge is there. No wonder it's an interesting thing when you're not sleeping. <coughs> but really building companies and products and services around new technology, and this is recent A16Z data that I'm showing here just now, um, the businesses are native to these new technologies. So of course, trucks, you know, highways allowed McDonald's to happen. Highways allowed Walmart to happen in retail. Equally, what the web and smartphones allowed Airbnb in travel. Now, Airbnb is the world's largest hotel company that doesn't own any hotels. It's not a hotel company, it's a tech company. Uber, uh, it's, it's the world's largest taxi company that doesn't own any taxis. It's not a taxi company, it's a tech company. And actually, many of the, the ways that we will all advance and innovate is understanding the technical side of what we do and how that adds into the physical world in the same way as an Airbnb or an Uber with uh, rooms or, or taxis. Here's a, this is financial innovation. This is a bunch of uh, farmers uh, in Afghanistan selling sheep on Instagram. Okay, now that is financial innovation not a mobile app for your current account, right? This is people in the world who are making the world anew uh, and hacking away at these tools that are so available for everyone. This is amazing. This is bringing people out of poverty. Uh, I recently heard that um, when, the, the, when the Afghan police force were moved from, onto uh, electronic transfers of their pay, they thought that they had been given a one-third pay rise. <laughs> It was not, it was just that their bosses were not taking notes out of those envelopes. You know, so how do we solve corruption internationally? How do we feed the poor? How, when we give to charity and we're so worried that we know the percentage of that money which is going to some tin pot dictator somewhere and the people we want to get that money aren't getting access to it, we can use technology to do this stuff. So it's not just about angry birds and uh, what sandwich you've got on Twitter. You know, th th these technologies allow fundamental growth uh, in humanity. And I'm very, don't worry, I'm going to rough, I'm going to very rapidly run through a couple of these things. So this is more about my world, the things which are interesting, the things that these technologies allow. So I hate the term the Internet of Things, uh, but nonetheless, people use it. But sensors everywhere. And many of you in museums, people have been talking about what you can do with, uh, with eye beacons and all of that sort of stuff. But fundamentally, these networks of low-cost sensors, they're changing everything from data collection to monitoring to decision-making um, and the economic potential of it is so huge. So moving away from this sector for a second, thinking about, you know, in a factory where you would have a, a machine and in the old days you would have a wee lad on a bicycle, you know, who'd, who'd cycle down to see if the machine was working. And now, of course, for, for, since the 80s, we've had some kind of sensors associated with those machines to see if they're working, and that's been fine. But the sensors are now so cheap, so ubiquitous, and the software around them is so incredible that it allows the next 
thing to happen. And the next thing to happen, well, those sensors, what were they used for? They were used for optimization. They would, that was the thing, they had a sensor on it and it allowed you to make the thing work better. Optimization, when did, when did you need down cycles? But the sensors now not only allow that, but they allow you to make the next one better. It allows changes in design based on data. And that's the circle, which is incredible. Cloud computing, we're all aware of uh, how our phones run in terms of that, the platforms as a service, using these cloud computing to, to drive so much productivity across the world uh, and deliver, delivering healthcare to the third world and elsewhere. Advanced robotics, there's so many incredible things happening now. I don't know if many have seen, there's an Edinburgh company called Touch Bionics that makes incredible robotic limbs for people, amputees. And you've probably seen the YouTube videos of people crying because you, you learn to use it with the, uh, the, the remaining musculature that you had in your arm, so your brain works it. It's just unbelievably amazing. Robotic surgery becomes a reality. Next generation genomics, where we're using data in order to find drug discovery, faster disease detection, and so on. Autonomous vehicles. Uh, thinking about, you know, people are freaking out about autonomous vehicles, but, uh, you know, imagine driving. It's one of the most dangerous things ever. If you ha it's a game where you have to keep absolute concentration at all times. You're going at 70 miles an hour, and if you lose concentration for a second, not only may you kill yourself, you may kill some other people. That sounds like a rubbish pastime to me. Uh, so, uh, so the potential with self-driving cars to, to save lives and also lower, because you're not all of the, the, the braking and so on, actual fuel consumption uh, over time changes massively. So this is the world that we're trying to look at and trying to bring teams together who are amazingly creative and, and trying to change the world in some way. So you know, what are we doing in Edinburgh? Well, Scottish people believe we invented everything, and that's not true. We just invented nearly everything. Um, but I, and I absolutely stretch this, this metaphor a bit far, but, but what I see uh, in, in the software world with the people that I have in with me is that this, that industrial mindset of bigging, building big hard stuff, building steam engines and bridges, actually that has moved its way into the software world now, where people are trying to build what the Americans would call gnarly stuff. Here, ignore the weird guy in the middle. Um, we've got a nice view in a very, very ugly building just up from the grass market. Uh, it's a quarter of a million square foot building, uh, we, which we, we tripled in size in a year. I now have 62 tech product companies across all different areas, from healthcare to security to games companies and everything else. But it was Paul Graham who, from Silicon Valley and, and Y Combinator, the first accelerator program, that said that you needed three things to have a great tech ecosystem. You needed nerds, rich people, and a place they wanted to live. Now, actually, I think the, the ecosystem in terms of what we're really trying to build here is a bit more complicated, and I think we've got a bit of a feel for it. You do need some of the big players. You do need some of the big companies. Sometimes it's because they can help um, get something to market. Sometimes it's because there's some people who are working in that big company that hate it and want to come out and have their own ideas. You have to have the universities. It's just as a talent pool. I just want to vacuum all of the talent that comes out of the universities and get them doing cool stuff. Who wants to work in the bank? Go and do something better. You need to have um, technically literate people um, I'm sure they would slap me for calling them nerds, but nonetheless. Uh, you need creative talent and you need technical talent. And that's something that we've got in spades. We really genuinely do. Um, you have to have that lifestyle and culture, a, a place that people want to live. You know, people lionize Silicon Valley. If, if you've been, it's rubbish. It's rubbish, it's strip malls all over the place, it's dreadful, you know, and so, yes, they've got big checkbooks and yes, there's lots of, you know, kids making lots of money. But the reality is, Europe has the culture in a way that you know, Silicon Valley does not. And if there is a USP for all of the jargon which may dribble into my presentation, if there is something unique about what we can do, where are the opportunities? The opportunities are to take those, two, those train tracks. That, uh, you're thinking about Edinburgh, you've got these highly technical people and some of the most creative people um, that, that exist on the planet. And getting those people together to make new things is amazing. So you've got to have some homegrown success stories, and I'll talk about some of them. You need to have some cash to make it happen, which is always, uh, always tough. And you've got to have this thing at the bottom called entrepreneurial density. 
Edinburgh's quite good. I think it's a bit of a Goldilocks city because it's it's not too big that it's really annoying to get around, um, and but it's it's uh, but it's big enough that you've got good restaurants and good coffee and that kind of stuff. And you need to have that. You need to have a place where people can get together. That network effect is absolutely vital. And so things like today, these are the networks that actually create the new ideas that make people aren't reinventing the wheel, that they can spot the good ideas that other people are using and bring them into their own world. So in terms of the tech ecosystem, we've had some great success stories. You'll have heard of Skyscanner, the world's fastest growing search engine, uh, with their billion dollar valuation after the Sequoia investment. The day after that investment happened, my phone started ringing with uh, folks from around the world looking to see who's next. Uh, so I hope it's a little bit like, uh, you know, like when a band comes out of a town and the record labels all start turning up. So hopefully it means we can get some more. Uh, some more cash happening. Uh, Rockstar North, Grand Theft Auto 5, over a billion in the first three days of selling. A uh, company I was fortunate enough to incubate, FanDuel, Daily Fantasy Sports, uh, they recently raised 275 million, which gave them their, their billion dollar valuation. This year, they will give away $2 billion in prize money. And the beautiful thing about that company is they employ amazing design trained talent, amazing artists, amazing user interface designers, because that experience, that mobile experience aligned to the data analytics is the core advantage. And we're very fortunate that we've trebled in size in a year and we're now the UK's largest. So thinking about the museum opportunity, um, and quite right in terms of what you're talking about, um, you know, Part of the reason why I, I joined the board of the International Festival was to start driving some of this digital agenda into the, the wider cultural sector. Mm -hmm. Because with this young companies that I've got, they understand a whole bunch of this stuff, inbound digital marketing and uh, <coughs> things that you can do with me money uh, to build. And when I'm looking at and becoming depressed by some of the news stories in terms of what's happening with some of the public funding, whether it's capped, which we all know means you know, a genuine decline, it's almost as if there's this idea in, in governments or local councils or whoever they may be of this idea of managed decline. That, okay, well, we need to, we, we're getting slightly less and less money over the years and then, you know, how can we manage that and what can we do? And, and, and that is utterly depressing to me because it's just fundamentally wrong in so many levels. They we're squandering not only our cultural heritage, but our cultural future and the ability to do amazing things. And so I'm very fortunate with the companies that I have in terms of the, the ambition that they've got. But they've got great ambition, but they get no money. So what I wanted to talk to you today about, um, and after the, the preamble about, about the world was, you know, we have strategies of how we make things when we've got no money. And yes, of course, we get the headlines that I've just told you about when it's right, it's, it's incredibly successful and, and amazing, but you can do it when you are not capitally rich. So I wanted to talk about the tech startup processes, a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors around what we do. Um, and it's not all Mark Zuckerberg making Facebook and so on. Um, the most important thing for any innovation is this. How do you know if your idea is any good? Because your idea is just an idea. It's just a hypothesis. You've got to test that out. The worst thing possible is when people work for two years and building their thing and then they, uh, two years later, say, ta-da, and no one wants to, to engage with it. No one wants to use it. No one's interested in it. Um, and we need to, to break that because we don't have any money. So what is a startup? Steve Blank said that a startup was a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. The key word there is temporary, which is an interesting thing. Another way of saying it from Dave McClure, who's a bit more sweary than even I, uh, and he said a startup is a company that's completely confused about what its product is, who its customers are, and how to make any damn money. The split second it figures out those things, it's not a startup anymore, it's a real company. Now, the fact is people hold on to that startup name because it's kind of cool at the moment. And Skyscanner ain't a startup anymore. You know, Fanduel is not a startup anymore. But that's the important thing. It's, it's about searching. So how do you go from zero to one to take that idea? How do you start? 
So this idea of this temporary nature of this, the idea is that, that a startup is searching and these processes I'm going to talk about are about that search when you've got no money. And once you've found that, that's when you execute. So a, a company is there to make things happen and to execute on those ideas. And they're, fun, they're, they're related but fundamentally different things. A startup is not a small version of a big company. So there's a number of tools that which we use. This is just one of them. This is the business model canvas. You can go online and many of you will probably use them already. I'm sure post-it notes as far as the eye can see. The important thing for me here is there's a fundamentally different way of thinking. I do not want to see a business plan. You know, a, a, someone asks you for a business plan with a five-year cash projection. A business plan is just a business guess. Once you're a company, you can do a business plan because you know how to execute. But that first early days, of it's an idea. Something like a business model canvas is a much better way to get your head around what it is. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to build? What's the value there? Would you need to partner with someone? Would you not? What resources do you really need? What kind of revenue streams might you have? And you can play around with it and test it. So importantly, we need to do things differently from traditional models of building anything. So that means we've got to be lean. Now, there's a whole bunch talked about being lean and agile and the lean startup and so on, and, you know, and I'm also here to demystify that, hopefully. Uh, the, the lean bit is about, uh, you would say, being capitally efficient. The lean bit is about doing something when you're skint and testing it. So the really it breaks down to three things. This thing, and again, apologies for the outrageous uh, verbiage I'm chucking in your general direction today, uh, but nonetheless, uh, these are useful ideas. So the idea of a minimum viable product, you don't wait two years to build something. You want to build something fast, test it out, and if it's right, you keep doing it. If it's wrong, you stop doing it. This idea of pivots, which I'll get to in a second, and the idea of early adopters. So a minimum viable product. Most of the failures happen, and again, I'm talking about startups, but it's about any new initiative which your, your people may try to put forward. Most of them fail because they built the wrong stuff. Because they had a hypothesis, they had an idea, oh, everyone's going to love this, and they go off and build it, and no one loves it. Uh, and it fails because it runs out of money. So building the bare minimum, test it, see if it works, experiment, learn from that, and fail fast. And this is it. You got your idea, you build a version of the thing. Is an exhibit is a pop-up version. You put four people in a team onto building a little pop-up version of that in, in, the, in the museum and test it out. Do people like it? Do people get to, uh, do the staff get to do one a week? Uh, the crappiest, simplest, cheapest, weird way of doing something and testing it out with people, with users, and seeing what's good or not. You have your idea, you build something, the product, then you measure like a scientist. You actually work it out. You take that learning, that's data, you learn from that and you build again. And the, the point is this circle, the faster you can go around this, the less money you're spending so that you're not skint by the time you act, because it takes a lot of time to go through this until you find that nugget of gold. That, and it's often the thing that you, it's, it's often something that you didn't think would necessarily work, but that's how to do it. And in a sense, this idea of customer development, really see all of this stuff I'm talking about. The most important thing is that it's essentially looking at a customer focused piece. So rather than looking at what we want to do, what's good for us? How do we make money? What do people want? How do you delight people? How do you give people an amazing time? And the truth is, you, in this left hand side, you want to have that discovery. What is their pain? And I'll talk about that in a second. Building something, testing it out. And if people love it, you do more of it and you turn it into a real thing. And if they don't, you pivot, you change direction. So almost everyone pivots. This change in direction when necessary. This failing bit, you have to... Uh, it's, large organizations sometimes cripple this because it's seen that if you did something wrong, you've wasted some money. This is not wasted money. You, the things you learn when you're going on that journey help you for the next thing you're building. And creating those amazing workplaces of committed, creative people that have the ability to fail, that have the ability to try something, and if it doesn't work, they don't get destroyed for it at a, you know, at a board level. Because not clinging to your idea is the thing. Okay, so the idea doesn't matter. Ideas are valueless, right? There, there's no, ideas don't matter. It's execution and doing something amazing which does. The thing you started off, the idea, uh, is going to change. 
You know, it's not going to look like the idea you started with. So the most important thing is in trusting that you've hired and you have an amazing team of people. If you, if you hire great creative people, you have confidence in their thinking, not in just one idea. It's the way that they think which has the value. And that learning over time, that's what will allow you to choose which particular technology. Is it flavor of the month or is it transformative? Is it something amazing? All, every single, you can look it up, I'm not going to bore you with it, every single one of these companies does something totally different from what they do today. They all had massive pivots. And you will too with any new idea that you, and each of you have examples where you've, you've gone through some of that. The other thing is looking at different customers. The fact is with any of this really early, really new stuff, it's these early adopters. It's people you're not addressing the mass market. Everyone who, who rocks up at your front door, they are different and segmenting them is so vital, understanding who they are. So you're, you need to grow this small number of innovators, people who will take a risk on the cutting edge stuff. Your first customers, these are the most valuable, these are the ones that will shout about how amazing it is and they will, like a virus, they will spread how good that is. This thing at the bottom, do things that don't scale. A lot of the stuff that I do in technology is all about scaling and, and, and you know, on the internet because you can reach lots of people. But those human interactions are the vital ones. Uh, doing the stuff that doesn't scale, having those relationships, doing uh, you know, uh, amazing programs with people that, uh, that have a, a lasting effect on them that they always remember. Those are the things that keep people coming back. Money is not your most precious resource. It's time. Wasting time is the killer of all of this stuff. Again, using these ideas of being as fast as you can and, and changing direction to find the right thing, it's the time which you don't have. So the first thing, this idea of product market fit, you want to rapidly find out if people love it when it's cheap. And if people love it, then you invest in it. Okay, but don't confuse both. You have to find out fast, is it the right thing? And maybe it's just slightly different. How do you rapidly find out what's right? And once you've You've got it, this idea of product market fit. You've done the right thing, then you scale it, then you invest in it, then you put staff resources into it. And again, this stuff, product market fit means being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. It's so blindingly obvious, and I know it sounds so corporate, but it's this bit about customer discovery. You know, and I would say get out of the building, but actually with some of you, it's, it's get into your building. Uh, so normally I've got a bunch of people that you would normally lock away in a room and put tatty scones under the door while they're coding. Uh, and, uh, and all of you are better, that are, have more fortunate because you have social skills and you can speak to human beings. Uh, but, but, you know, the rumors are true. Use it and learn from those people. Who are they? What do they want? They're coming for different reasons. Build different things for them. So who, first of all, you've got to guess, right? So you're guessing what the target market is. You've got to talk to them, but then you've got to understand their pain. Building personas is actually, it seems really crappy, right? You know, oh God, personas. It's actually one of the most vital things. Trying to actually sit and think, who would those people be? Who are the nine different kinds of folks who actually come to your door? And thinking through what it is, why are they coming? What are they interested in? How do they live their lives? What kind of money do they like to spend? What do they not like to spend money on? This, again, it's all about this use. I'm not focused on, I'm going to build this microphone or whatever. I want to know, do people want a microphone? And so going at this stuff from the user, so building performance personas and then build their stories. How do they live their life? What do they do in a day? Why are they coming to you? So what is the pain? Everything, there's some pain that you're solving. Who are they? Will they pay enough? Uh, and is the market big enough for that? And the solution, these days, it's so cheap. So we've got folks that just start out and within a day at a hackathon or whatever, they've made a simple landing page to test their idea. And it can be as simple as they've kind of got five ideas, so they make five web pages and it, oh, it's a single page that just says that's the idea and they can track how many people go on. So they have given them a better idea of what to do. Kickstarter, most people don't use Kickstarter to raise money. Most people use Kickstarter to do pre-market validation to see if anyone cares. Because if no one cares, no one's going to do it. Because you can't shout louder than the internet. You know, the, the world's changing. We're being shouted at so much 
We can't shout louder. We don't have the budgets to shout louder. We have to engage. We have to find new ways of finding people who love us and love what we do because none of us have the market spend to try and beat Facebook or Coca-Cola. Oh yeah, this one's slightly tongue in cheek, so don't hit me for it. The idea is build an MVP, find some early adopters, get paid, and then just repeat. Uh, but you know, we all know it's slightly more complicated than that. But you know, before talking about this stuff and building absolutely new things, quite often I go on museum web and they're not responsive. And I'm like, how can I even have a conversation? I can't find out, well, A, they don't allow photography as well, which is just madness. Your TripAdvisor scores, we were talking about that last night, you know, and again, the reason I don't want to go into too much of that is uh, most of you are not technically naive. Most of you are, sit and are, are utterly engaged with some of the amazing innovations that are happening in museums and galleries and, and, and heritage institutes across the world. So I'm not going to chuck all of that at you. But understanding the way people want to live in the world and making it easy, like finding opening times, you know. But once you do this, this idea of what are the jobs to be done? What to People are actually coming for a reason. You know, even the ones that we think aren't really, they're coming for a specific reason. Is it socializing? Is it the kids were greeting? Is it that they, they actively want to learn? Do they want to share something? Do they just want space to think? A combination of all of these, something else. Delighting people is the marketing. We're in the, when, you know, we want people to, to, to laugh and to cry and to have unbelievable emotional experiences. We want people to engage in new ways. How do we delight each of those different types of users? So yes, I'll chuck a few things. You know, many of you are aware there's some great stuff happening. Uh, you see, you know, outside uh, the, the chaps from St. Andrews that have got the, the virtual reality. I have to say, you know, I remember the, the original years in, uh, you know, uh, Gibson's Neuromancer and so on, and it was rubbish. But the latest SDK, or, or the late, the, the, I recently tried the most recent version of Oculus, and it was the single most transformative hardware experience I've ever had in my life. Uh, and even the gap between the previous version and this one made me realize that there were things which I would have thought were comedy that I would now do because it's so, it, you're there, it's so amazing. Uh, and it's one of those things that you can't really explain and you have to try it out. And it's so amazing when it's done right. Um, suddenly things appear like something that I would have thought was insanity that no one would ever pay real money for. But if I could come back from work and spend 20 minutes sitting on a beach in Mauritius, I'd pay for that. And that sounds totes, and if you haven't tried it, it sounds totally foolish. You could, what a, a, tour, a, a guided tour of, the, of, of Luxor with, with an amazing, an amazing interpretive, you know, someone who can actually talk me through that. Um, I would pay serious cash if I can just sit in my house and have an unbelievable tour and yes, in a sense, just now you're kind of sitting on rails, as it were, you're, you're moving around because you're not walking yet. But the ability to move around and actually look and, and be there is it, it, it's so amazing that there's real money to be made there. And of course, each of you will be aware of different ways that you can apply that. You have people who are in America who can have a tour of your museum, that's one, obviously. Equally, some of the heritage side. Imagine being able to spend the day in a life, imagine a 10 year old being able to spend the day in a life of a 10 year old uh, at the time of the pharaohs. You know, that, that stuff is, is transformative, it's delightful, it, it changes lives, that, 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 this, it's amazing. Augmented reality, of course, and I know there've been a lot of missteps, a lot of people have been hurt by this being rubbish before, but now it's getting so much better. Having this augmented response of being in the world, I mean, this, the ideas that people talk around of um, no one reading the signs and so on at museums, but actually having the ability to see more. Uh, it, it, we're only at the beginning of this and the delight and the, the extra meaning that you can get from that is so amazing. Um, in terms of collaborations, many of you have seen things like Artsy and so on, um, where essentially it, it's a startup with, with screens that uh, people will pay money in their houses and elsewhere to stream to have artwork uh, presented and they've, they're collaborating with a range of museums. There's a whole bunch of tech startups that are doing things where you can monetize. 
and building those, and this is the boring bit, building those APIs with your software engineers so that you can easily integrate with these people. That's the hard bit. Using hackathons to promote upcoming openings, or, you know, ha everyone talks about hackathons, but the, the, the issue is, it's always what next? You get 48 hours of people coming over in sleeping bags, and you build some amazing stuff, and you've opened up your APIs and your data for them, and that's all awesome. And then on Monday morning, they all go back to the day jobs. Actually, the things which can be built in hackathons can be worth huge sums of money, and often they need a tiny amount of cash. So one of the things that I'm interested in doing in terms of investment is investing. Sometimes it's 10, 20 grand at a time into people coming through that so that you can give them enough cash to give it a go. But as you all know better than, better than anyone, museums are social institutions. And increasingly they're collaborative, they're focused on engagement more than uh, just straight presentation. They're developing online as well as physical experiences to reach to more and engage more. So there's tools that we would use in tech startups that, to be honest, I think every museum should be using some of these. Things like Salesforce. So Salesforce is a, a CRM, a customer relationship management tool. You can act, so rather than just footfall, how many people come in the door? Uh, what was your profit? Uh, how much fundraising have you done this year? Those metrics that all of you are focused on. There's a whole bunch of other bits of data that you can start to get. And you can incentivize people with, with points and competitions and all this kind of stuff. But if you don't know who you, they are, you can't reach out to them. So one of the things which is really interesting for tech startups is that there's a whole bunch of these SaaS, software as a service, these really cheap tools that allow a company that I've got that I've got no money to, to do stuff that only a McDonald's or a Coca-Cola could ever have afforded before in terms of things like marketing and so on. Here's a few of them. Slack has completely killed internal email. Um, you know, just why would you ever have an a internal email conversation again in your organization? Just use Slack. You get the mobile notifications. You can you stop a whole bunch of nonsense in the organization. Things like Trello for product management. It's free to use. Go on Trello. We use it for product management, all, linking all the tasks that people are doing. And you can see what people are doing. And you can work with them on that front. Things like Salesforce, of course. HubSpot for inbound marketing. Most of my startups get about 80% of their business from inbound content marketing, from writing blog posts and so on, and monetizing from that, because they don't have money to pay for adverts. There's things like Unbounce and Blossom and other tools. So really, this cultural mindset, we actually have, and we should be amazingly ambitious. We're at a moment in time, and I know we're in this ugly building that you could just walk past in Edinburgh. You probably close one eye as you walk past it because it's so ugly. But within that building, you don't have to go to Silicon Valley for this stuff. Edinburgh in Scotland is an incredibly interesting place because we have this amazing mix, this cultural mix of, of technological minds, entrepreneurial minds. We have the culture and we have the talent across the board. Let's do something with it. So this was more a call to arms. This is, you know, we're here, say hi. Uh, we're friendly, we may be a bit geeky, uh, but we know a lot of this stuff and we're here to help. So thank you for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Jamie, the first question, if I may, uh, this is someone trying to get ahead of the curve here. Uh, info panels, then QR codes, now eye beacons. What's the next thing? What's the next big thing for information provision along these lines? I think the f yeah. So things like eye beacons, the problems there are just now is that the, the, the sort of th three meter distance, so it can be really problematic to get that high, that serious location associated with it. Uh, the truth is. All of this stuff, it's the fact that uh, this is a supercomputer in everyone's pockets. And again, I know that a lot of museums have been hurt in terms of trying to do mobile and well, people download the app and all of that. But the fact is this is a supercomputer that can do so much. And whether it's associated with a, with a watch or whatever, it's linking in the computing processing power that they have on them already when they walk in. That's the way, and whether it ends up being a better eye beacon, which can, is probably a mix of different solutions. 
But importantly, we, in a sense, I don't want to spend lots of money on hardware. Hardware, the sensors and things are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I want to spend money on uh, the kinds of services that people can download and getting people to use an app. And again, we know how to help people and make them want to do it. If it's £1.49 in the app store, I had one youngster who <coughs> paid his whole way through university with me, hot desk with me, and he paid his way through university with his Groove Shark app at £1.49 in the app store, and he had over 100,000 downloads. And I had to get him tax advice. You know, <laughs> we've, we've got people that, you know, it can be done. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. Supercomputer in the pocket. Thank you, Michael. Uh, two others. Um, how can museums attract creative and tech talent to work in the sector when we're competing with higher wages in other sectors? Uh, the flippant answer is you can't. <laughs> but actually, the deeper answer is you, you don't have to. So in, this, in one sense, uh, we, the beauty of, the, of this sector is that people are unbelievably passionate and want to get into it because life's not just about, if you want to make, go and work in JP Morgan, who wants to do that? You'll get a big wage, you'll get a grand a day day rate, and who, do any of you want to do that? And you just, you'd end up shooting yourself, you'd be very wealthy, but you'd blow your brains out. So no, uh, the, the truth is that who wants to do that for their living? No, you want to work somewhere amazing, but you also want to work in a, in a situation where you are empowered, where when you have ideas that they're respected by the organization and that they give you this chance to do it. The truth about the matter is, especially about developer talent, is it's not, you don't have to necessarily hire all of these people. The world of API, this is another talk, so I won't. So we're in an unbundled world just now where APIs finally enable us to link in and, and use the best of lots of different stuff. So before, when you would have, uh, you would have bought Microsoft Office, because it worked on a PC and you had everything, you had PowerPoint and Excel and you had Word and it just worked and that was fine. That was a bundled world. Whereas now, some of these tools like Slack, we're in this unbundled world where you've got young companies and people who could just do one thing right. They don't try and do everything, they do one thing right, but technically they have APIs that mean they can link in with everything. So when you say, well, my ticketing system for the museum is this, so it's going to be a nightmare if I want to use anything else, the API will just integrate with it and you can make those things happen. And in a sense, that's why Google won against Yahoo and Search. Yahoo was great on Search, it had the weather, it had fashion and everything else. Google just had a box. It did one thing right. Okay, so doing one, for each of these new innovations, these new ideas, don't try and do lots of stuff, do one thing right. If you were walking through a supermarket and you saw a combined TV and DVD player, you already know it's rubbish before you even look at it. <laughs> Why? Because it's trying to do two things, we don't trust it. So with all of these things, do one thing right and integrate with APIs. So bringing in amazing services. You don't have to build a CRM, there's amazing ones, they're all there. I'm glad you mentioned CRM because I got another question about Salesforce CRM. Would you recommend it for using it as a fundraising database? Actually, I probably would. You've got to hack it a wee bit and you've got to be a bit clever and play around with it, but you absolutely can. Okay. And I'm going to run over, guys, because I think this is okay. Um, how would you respond to people who are resistant to adopting technology for heritage learning and interpretation? <laughs> it's fine, go for it. Um, the fact is, in that curve of, of people who are using things, um, there's, the reality is there's an awful lot of goodness which happens w with people being physically there. That's stuff that doesn't scale. This is not that it's all got to be digital. That's, that's not the case. There's incredible value and being able to work with people and being passionate and caring. Um, the fact is that over time, being able to do more um, with what you've got, to take th that data and, and do more with it and to learn more and to spread the word more. You know, when I think of uh, you know, helping some of uh, a company who's what, making, an artisan who's making leather belts or someone who's a, a fine artist, and you would think they're the least digital people, but actually, they can use the internet to find more people, and those people may be in China or Japan who would want to pay them more money so that they don't have to work in a coffee shop. So, it's not for This is the last question, I'm afraid. Um, do we run the risk of dependency on tech-based systems to attract more visitors to the museum? Can we go too far there, this road? Yes, so if you fundamentally don't have amazing content with amazing people, um, then you've got nothing. 
So the core is, <laughs> the, core is the, it's the human capital. It's the amazing people, it's the amazing collections and the insight into that collection. The, these are just new ways of letting people find out how amazing you already are. I said that for the last question, I lied. When you put up time and money, if you'd had people on that slide, where would you put people? Well, people that? are the, what allows everything to happen. Can I thank you?